My guest this week on Straight Talk is Dennis Healy, Labour's Defence Secretary in the 1960s, Chancellor of the Exchequer in the 1970s, and Deputy Leader of the Labour Party in the 1980s. Dennis Healy, is British politics better or worse for being less ideological than it was in your day? Well, it depends what you mean by politics. I mean, as an exciting career, I think it's nothing like as good as it was when I first came into politics after the war. But um, I think in terms of being able to get sensible things done, it's a bit better now. But have we lost a bit of the passion, a bit of the big personality, maybe even a bit of the public interest? They don't. I think we have. Uh, in fact, I know we have because the percentage of people bothering to vote has fallen very, very substantially since the last World War. Yet people join Greenpeace, they join the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Well, this the is National it. National Trust, it's just it's politics. They're, they're more interested in saving the whale than in saving the world these days. <laughs> but is it the people to blame or is it the politicians to it's blame? It's not a question of blame at all. I think the basic thing is that the sharp divisions between the classes which existed when I first came into politics after the war when uh, working class people wore cloth caps, middle class people wore bowlers or trilbies later, and of course the toffs wore top hats. That's all gone. And because of the Attlee period in government, when he that was aimed. After the Second World War. And exactly. Attlee was determined not to win the class war, but to end it. And by introducing a welfare state uh, based on the wartime beverage plan, I think he did get that process well underway. And, of course, there have been very big changes, too, in the structure of politics. The role of the trade unions has almost disappeared. But has it all gone, and our class system? Are we not still a society of, of huge privilege? And if you're born into one of these sink estates oh, of well, huge lost opportunity? The, yes, but the point is the overwhelming majority of people now regard themselves as middle class. In my time, I would say that 60 or 70 percent regarded themselves as working class, 20 or 30 percent as uh, middle class, and uh, only a tiny number of people mainly very wealthy landowners, that sort of thing, regarded themselves as upper class, and that has completely changed. You mentioned the Attlee government, the, the first Labour government after yes. the war, came in in '45 with a huge majority, a surprise victory against Winston Churchill at the, at the time. Compare now with then in terms of, I mean, how do Mr Blair and Mr Brown stack up against Clement Attlee and Ernie Bevan? Well, I think in some ways uh, Gordon Brown has a lot of Ernie Bevin in him in that he's got very strong sense of values and a very gritty determination to try to get them carried into practice and Ernie had that feeling very much too. Ernie, of course, was the illegitimate son of a farming girl Whereas Gordon Brown is the, Gordon, son of a the son of a Presbyterian minister. Well, he's the son of the manse, exactly. So there, there are differences, but that similarity is there. I don't think there was anybody quite like Tony uh, in the athlete time. I suppose the nearest thing, and not very near, would be someone like Herbert Morrison. Now, how then would... Mr. Blair and uh, Mr. Brown stack up against Harold Wilson and Jim Callaghan? Well, I think uh, Blair and Wilson have a certain amount in common. And Brown, I think, has a lot in common with Jim in the sense that he's very good at deciding what are the really important things to get done 
and to be tackled and concentrating on those and not spending a lot of time on the rest. And that, I think, he has in common. If you look back over the sweep of the history of the Labour Party in your lifetime, in mm -hmm. your politically active lifetime, you, you went to the Labour Conference in '45 in your major's uniform straight from, That's right, from, yeah. from the army. Who are the true greats of the Labour movement? Without question, I think uh, <clears throat> in terms of character and performance, Ernie Bevin was the outstanding... And he was Attlee's foreign Great secretary. Man, exactly, he was Attlee's foreign secretary. He's the chap who created the relationship with the United States, which became the pivot of our foreign policy. And uh, <coughs> he, of course, was immensely concerned with the welfare state and giving working people a better life. Um, Cripps, I think, had... An immense influence, but a more limited one. He was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He was Chancellor of the Exchequer, and uh, he came from an upper-class family, but rather like Clem, because Clem went to a public school. Um, but um, it, after his great quality, which Callaghan, I think, was the only man who had the same quality who succeeded him, was an ability to run a team... Uh, of very different and sometimes hostile personalities. I mean, Attlee had to deal with Ernie Bevin and Nye Bevan. Who was uh, the left-wing firebrand. And, fire and uh, it, was, uh, it was not an easy team to run, and I think he had extraordinary skill in doing that and keeping them all together. When you look at the, the benign environment that, Gordon Brown has enjoyed as Chancellor yes. of the Exchequer. Do you sometimes wish you had been Chancellor 20 years later? Well, I would have very much appreciated having the sort of world Gordon has to deal with, but, of course, it's a completely different world and a different society in Britain. I mean, the big thing now is that class divisions have almost disappeared. Nearly everybody, as I said, regards themselves as middle class now. There's no challenge from the left to the Labour Party leadership, um, either in policy or personality. There's no Nye Bevan or Tony Benn. And above all, I think, the, there is no problem with the trade union movement in until really John Smith introduced one man, one vote and made certain that the whole membership of the union elected its leader and the leader was responsible to them, the so-called trade union barons, really made up policy entirely on their own. A change in the leadership of a union could lead to a complete reversal of its policy. But that, of course, is no longer the case. And, indeed, the unions themselves have very, very much less influence than they had in the old days. I mean, previous Labour governments, Jim Callaghan, had to deal with the winter of discontent. Uh, we've not had that sort of problem at all. There are still some problems with some unions on some occasions, but not a permanent problem like there was in the old days. Uh, as you say, Gordon Brown's had, a, had an easier overall environment to deal with. So has Tony. Than, than yourself, and so has the Prime Minister. Um, how do you feel, though, w with your time at the Treasury being regarded as a time that was synonymous with crisis and the decline of the country? Well, two things. First of all, we were burdened. We didn't realize it was a burden at the time with the st 